أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي I want to begin by saying how actually honored I am to be able to join you guys today. I go to, alhamdulillah, a lot of different communities, um, but there's definitely something special I feel about, about this community. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless your community and um, increase you. Um, mashallah, it's, it's nice to see so many people here, alhamdulillah. The topic today is about hardship and the path to the most merciful. And the reason why I like that topic, title, is because a lot of times we connect hardship to punishment. We connect hardship or to, to a uh, wrathful or, or you know, punishing type person or thing. We think of hardship always as a negative thing. And we're sort of programmed to think that way. We're programmed to think that ease, ease is a good thing and hardship is by definition a bad thing. But the reason why I like this statement is because it says hardship and the path to the most merciful. Because in fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful. And yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does send us hardship. Is that right? Every single human being on earth will go through hardship. So the question we have to ask ourselves is why? Why do we go through hardship? And what is the mercy behind hardship? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an, بَعْدَ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ أَمْ حَسِبْتُمْ أَن تَدْخُلُوا الْجَنَّةَ وَلَمَّا يَأْتِكُمْ مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ خَلَوْا مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ مَسَّتْهُمُ الْبَأْسَاءُ وَالضَّرَّاءُ وَزُلْزِلُوا حَتَّى يَقُولَ الرَّسُولُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَعَهُ متى نصر الله ألا إن نصر الله قريب This ayah is so powerful because this ayah is saying and this is ayah 214 of Surah Al-Baqarah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is saying or do you think that you shall enter Jannah that you shall enter paradise without such trials as came to those who passed before you they encountered suffering and adversity and were so shaken. You know, um, in Cali I'm from California. And in California, we have, what's our nat natural disaster in California? Earthquakes. earthquakes. The word for earthquake in Arabic is, is zilzal. Here, this word is wazulzilu from the same root. They were shaken. They were so shaken in spirit that even the messengers and those who had faith with them cried out, when will the help of Allah come? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends this ayah by saying, giving us hope and saying, Ala inna nasrullahi qareeb. Indeed, verily, the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is near. So the beginning of this ayah, is making us realize that we are not the first people to ever be tested. We are not the first people to ever suffer. You know sometimes when you're going through something difficult, you feel like you're the only person in the world who ha who's feels that way. You're the only one in the world who's going through what you're going through. And although everyone experiences things differently, but are we the only ones in the world who suffer? That what, what happens sometimes by feeling that way is we become isolated. Because we feel that I'm alone in my pain, or I'm alone in my hardship. But this isn't true. First of all, we are not the first to be, punished, to be, to be tested, to, to suffer, and we are not the last. And while we are going through our hardship, others are also going through hardships. And this is something that I'll go on to talk about. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about um, also in Surah Al-Imran. And then after telling us this, that we are not the first, it's not unique what we're going through. It's not unique that we are going through hardship. 
but that even before us, there were people who were so tested and they were so shaken that even the messengers and those who believed with the messengers cried out in the same way that we sometimes cry out when things are really hard. Meta Nasrullah. We, you know, we, we have our heart is asking, Meta Nasrullah, where is the help? When is the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala coming? And then Allah here is answering that, that question and saying, Ala inna Nasrullahi qareeb. Indeed, indeed, the, the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is near. So this not only comforts us because it tells us that we're not alone, we're not the first and we're not the last to go through hardship, but it also comforts us because it assures us that Allah's help is near. You know what? There's something amazing about this life. And it's actually this truth, this reality of this life that causes us, causes us pain sometimes. But it's also the same reality that gives us comfort. And that is the reality that nothing lasts. Nothing in this life lasts. Everything passes away. So sometimes that reality causes us pain. We have something we love, and then it goes away. It passes away, it ends, so we get sad. But that same reality is also a comfort, because when you're going through hardship, that also doesn't last forever. Nothing lasts forever, so not pleasure and not pain either. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, inna na'al usri yusra. You know this ayah, since we're kids, so I don't know why, but so many of us translate and understand this ayah incorrectly. We usually, if I were to ask someone to translate this ayah for me, most of the time they will say, after hardship comes ease, right? But that's incorrect. That's not what the ayah says, nor is that the reality. It says, inna ma'al usri yusra, and not inna ba'd al usri yusra. So what that means is with hardship is ease. With your hardship is ease. It is at the same time. So never think that when you're going through your hardship, no matter how hard it is, you still have ease. You still have something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you from His mercy to help you. I want you guys to think for a moment about, you know, bring to mind without getting you know, too upset about it. Bring to mind a time in your life where you, where you were going through a hardship. And when you think about that time, probably when you were in it, or maybe even looking back, you think of it as all bad. It was just all bad. But the truth is, if you really examine it, it was not all bad. There was some ease even within that hardship. For example, you may have had some trouble with one aspect of your life. But there was another aspect of your life that was good. You were healthy. Maybe your, your family was healthy. You had a roof over your head. You still had some ease to give you help in that hardship. You still had la ilaha illallah. You still had your iman, perhaps. And if you still have la ilaha illallah, you actually have everything. Our problem is that when we go through hardship, it's very difficult for us to see that. And what we do is we focus on the problem itself. And this is one of the main mistakes that we make when we go through a hardship. When, something in, when we encounter something that's difficult, the first thing that usually happens is now we kind of have to brace ourselves. And we think, oh man, how am I gonna deal with this? Or sometimes we think, oh boy, like, I'm gonna have to take this on. And all of a sudden we start to feel anxiety. And we start to feel worry. How am I going to deal with this? And we start to preoccupy ourselves with figuring out how to solve the problem. With figuring out how am I gonna get through it? Okay, should I do this? Should I do that? And what ends up happening is that we start to become focused on the problem itself. We start to become in fact preoccupied and obsessed with the problem itself. Soon enough, we're even thinking about the problem in every salah. Do you understand my point here? So now, instead of looking to the one who can solve our problem and seeking him to help us, 
We're trying to solve the problem ourselves. So what we've done here is we have shifted our focus from the one who solves all problems, from the one who can mend anything that's broken to that which has broken itself. We start to shift. So this is the problem. We have a problem. We have a difficulty. Now, instead of my heart focusing on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seeking His help and putting my trust on Him, putting my trust in Him, I instead shift the focus of my heart on the issue itself. And soon enough, it actually takes over my mind and my heart. And this is what causes anxiety. And this is what causes us to feel overwhelmed. Because I have a secret for you. You know when a professor gives you an exam? See, we have to unlearn the way we think about tests. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an that He will test us, right? We know that. So as soon as some, even if we're good believers, as soon as something hits us, we say, okay, I'm being tested. I gotta be, I gotta be strong now, right? But the mistake we make is we think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like a professor. When a professor gives you an exam, he hands you the exam and then he steps back and watches. He steps back to see, are you going to fail? Are you going to pass? And maybe he even wants you to fail. Now let me ask you this, when you're in an examination with a professor, are you allowed to raise your hand and ask for help? That's called cheating. And that's how we think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We think when we're given the examination, oh, I gotta do this myself. Allah's testing me, He's watching me, He's gonna see how I can do. I gotta depend on me. I gotta depend on me or I gotta depend on something else of the creation. And that is our mistake. We think we can't raise our hand and ask for help. And that's actually the purpose of the test. You see the difference? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a professor who gives you a test and then steps back and sees how you're gonna do. In fact, the test itself is given to you at times in order for you to raise your hand and ask for help. In order for you to go back to Him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an many ayat about hardship. Why are, why are hardship given to people? And one of the reasons Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says is لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ So that they will come back to us. Allah is actually giving the test so people will come back to Him and raise their hand and ask for help. In another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَعَلَّهُمْ يَضَّرَّعُونَ Tadarra is a very strong concept. Tadarra, you can translate tadarra as humility, humble yourself, but that's not enough. To really understand the intensity of tadarra, the intensity and, and, and um, the intense need and humility involved in this state. Imagine a person in the middle of an ocean. You're in the middle of an ocean on a boat. And you seem like you're safe, you think you're safe, and all of a sudden the storm hits. How many people have had storms hit in their life? And I'm not talking about literal storms. When the hardship hits, you know they say when it rains it pours? You know what this means? This, <laughs> this, this saying is like, you know when one thing goes wrong, everything goes wrong. Or it's so it seems, it feels like. So when the storm hits, in this middle of this ocean, the person begins, knee-jerk reaction, first thing that person does is it seeks the creation, it seeks the means for protection. What does that mean in this case? It means they're gonna call for help. They're gonna call the, you know, the Coast Guard. But only when that doesn't work, they look for the next means. Now they're gonna look for the lifeboat. But all the lifeboats are damaged. Now they're gonna look for the life jacket. But all of the life jackets are, 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 are also lost. Now they have exhausted every single means, every single avenue of the creation. Now what do they do when nothing else can work? Ya Allah. And this is what we do. When we, as soon as we are hit with a hardship, where do we turn first? That's a very important question to ask ourselves. Where do we go first? This is not to say we cannot seek the means. 
This is not to say I'm sick, I can't go to the doctor. But it means where do I turn first and where is my dependence? Who do I really think is going to save me from that storm? Do I really think that a doctor can cure me? Do I really believe that the medicine is curing me? Because if I do, I have been fooled. I have been deceived by the means. Those things are just tools. The medicine is just a tool. The doctor is just a tool. The one who cures, the one who saves is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when I'm in that storm and I'm in that boat, to bring it back to Tadarra, and at that point when I have nowhere else to turn, and the illusion of all the rest of the tools has been taken away from my eyes, and then I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what type of state I will be in, that is Tadarra. It is not just humility, it's absolute desperation. Finally, really realizing your need for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it isn't just raising your hand and asking for help. It is getting down on your hands and knees and begging for help. And that's actually the point. That's actually the point. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends you a hardship, the reason it feels heavy is because we're trying to carry it ourselves. We don't depend on Allah when we have a hardship. We might say that we depend on Allah, but the truth is, we try every other means. We'll call our friend, we'll call the doctor, we'll go to our bank account, we'll go to our house. We'll try to depend on everything else to solve our problem, but not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sometimes Allah, out of His mercy, does something amazing. You go, you have a problem, you go to your friend. But your friend hangs up the phone in your face, or your friend isn't there for you. Your friend lets you down. Then you go to, you know, you go to a doctor, or you go to this, and you go to that. And every single place that you try to go for help, or for refuge, the door gets slammed in your face. The door closes, another door closes, another door closes. Do you guys feel what I'm saying? And every time you seek those other means, the door closes in your face. Has that ever happened to you when you're at the hardest time in your life and you know you're like, I tried, you know, no one was there for me. Has anyone ever felt that way? No one was there for me when I needed them most. For some reason, this is like a rule of life, right? <laughs> when you, you know when you really, really need the life jacket, that's when it's not working. When you really need the lifeboat, that's when it's broken. When you really needed that friend, that's when she wasn't there for you. When you really needed that person, when you really needed the doctor to pick up, whatever it was, when you really needed it to work, that's when it doesn't. Do you ever wonder why that happens? One of the reasons why this happens, Wallahu ta'ala alam, Allah in this way directs you towards Him. Because we are trying to put our dependence in the wrong place. We're seeking help from the wrong things. We are not asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help. And instead we seek other things for help. Now do you guys ever realize, maybe you guys have experienced this, that you may have at first tried to seek help from other things. Seek other things to depend on to get you out of that problem. And when they didn't work, then what did you do? <coughs> Usually you'll find that you end up turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that you never would have otherwise. And you find that your closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most during those hardest times of your life. Do you know why that happens? Because of this concept. At that place, in that state of need, in that state of tadarra, is when we are closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now if Allah wants to bring us close, what, what does He do? You guys seeing where I'm going? If, if the only way you and I, because we're so engrossed in the illusions 
of the creation, if the only way we're going to turn to Him is when everything else is closed, so that's what He does. It is not a punishment if we respond correctly. In fact, it's a mercy. Because had that storm never come, had that storm never come, you would have never tasted that closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Perhaps. Some people may, but most people, unfortunately, get very deceived by ease. And Allah tells us this in the Qur'an, that when the storm hits, in the middle of the ocean, and the waves are like mountains surrounding them, that's when they call on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a state of tawheed. Now the tawheed happens. Allah brings us to tawheed in that situation. We're no longer asking from anyone else because no one else can help us. It's only when no one else can help us that we are able to ask Allah and Allah alone and really realize لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله that there is no change in state, no power, no strength, except by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And sometimes it takes a storm to make us realize that. But then Allah tells us that as soon as that person is saved and he goes to the shore, you know now things are easy again. What do we do? Just think about yourself. What do you do once that hardship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has saved you from it? What do you do? Be honest. Are you still asking Him in the same desperate, humble way? No. In fact, we become, we turn away from the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we become again distracted with our many distractions. Am I right? That is the way we are. So it is within the hardship itself that we are directed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what we have to do is this. Even in the ease, we need to not be deceived. A lot of people think that tests only come in the form of hardships. But do you know that an even greater test perhaps than hardship is the test of ease? Why is that? Remember I said on shore, on shore, we're farther from Allah. Because when, when we're given ease, it's even harder. That's why it's even harder to turn completely to Allah. That's why ease can be even a harder test than hardship. It's as if the hardship has, it's like a multiple choice test. But there's only one right answer. I'm sorry, there's only one option and it's the right answer. You get what I'm saying? Because Allah gives you the hardship and closes every other avenue of help. So basically, He's giving you a multiple choice exam with only one option, and it's Allah. So it's the right answer. Then as soon as you get into the ease, now you have lots of options in the multiple choice test. Now the question is there, but the answers are many. Your money, your status, your spouse, your friend, your father, your, your, your mother. You guys understand? And those are the things that we become distracted with. And those are the things that we begin to love more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that happens during ease often. So the test of ease is sometimes more difficult than the test of hardship. Now in talking about some of the other reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us hardship, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also speaks about something called tamhiz. And Allah says in one of the ayats about hardship, لِيُمَحِّصَ اللَّهَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا What that means is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the hardship in order to make those who believe undergo a process called tamhiz. What's tamhiz? Tamhiz is purification. But it's not just, you know, purification, but more specifically, <coughs> that's the Egyptian Adhan, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the concept of tamhiz is like what happens to gold. When you want to purify gold, what do you do to it? 
What do you do to gold to purify it? Melt it. Melt it. You heat it up. What happens when you heat up gold? <laughs> you remove all the impurities. Guess what happens when you heat up a believer? <laughs> Allah is doing that to the believer, he says in the Qur'an. When you heat up a believer, you put them through something hard. You heat them up. You're removing, Allah is removing the impurities. Because our insides are full of some good and some bad. And when Allah wants to separate the good from the bad, He gives us hardships. And it has that same that same effect that heating up gold does, that kamhiz. So in this way, hardship purifies us, it brings us back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it humbles us. Therefore, if we respond correctly to hardships, no hardship is a punishment for you. If you respond correctly, now what is the correct response to hardship? At the very least, the minimum that a believer should have as a response is sabr, patience. Patience, sabr means it, it may hurt internally, but you don't complain. You don't complain, and let me explain what I mean by complain, because sometimes this is misunderstood. Complaining about Allah is different than complaining to Allah. Complaining about Allah is different than complaining to Allah. Complaining about Allah means that you are not, you are complaining about the situation in that you are not, that you are resentful, that you are angry, that you're saying, Oh Allah, how could you do this to me? Oh Allah, why me? Why not that person? Why me all the time? That is not sub. We can never respond in that way. Because if we respond in that way, we will not get the benefits of hardship in the purification and in the humility and in the blessing and the mercy that, that, that can come out of it. But complaining to Allah is what even the prophets did. Yaqub alayhi salam, when he lost Yusuf alayhi salam, what did he say in Surah Yusuf? I complain of my sadness, my sorrow only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But was he complaining in that he was saying, Oh Allah, why did you do this to me? No, a'udhu billah. That's not the type of complaint. It's when you turn to Allah and you say, Oh Allah, help me, I'm weak. Oh Allah, it hurts. That's fine. You're complaining to Allah because Allah is your refuge. Your Allah is your refuge. If you're not going to go to Allah for refuge, where are you going to go? Really, where are you going to go? Even the Prophet ﷺ after Ta'if, what did he say? He complained to Allah. That is not ingratitude. Crying does not mean you are not in a state of self. The Prophet ﷺ cried when his son died. But his heart was patient. His heart was content with the decision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that doesn't mean you don't cry, and it doesn't mean you can't complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't hurt inside. It may hurt, but you are not angry at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are not complaining about what Allah gave you but you're asking for help, and you're admitting your own weakness. And then there's an even higher level than sub. The, the fruits of sub, among many, is that your sins will be erased. And we're told by the Prophet ﷺ that when a believer goes through any kind of pain, or hardship, or loss, even the prick of a thorn, and actually I, I have like scars. <laughs> I was, yeah, well, I have roses and they have thorns. And, and subhanAllah, they scratch me. I still have the scar, subhanAllah. And I remember that hadith. Because the hadith says that it removes your sins, even if it's a thorn prick. 
and I just specifically, it was a thorn prick, not a lot, <laughs> that the, it removes your sins like leaves falling from a tree. That's if you respond with some. But there's an even higher level of response to hardship. And that's rida. Rida is contentment. Sabr is when it still hurts inside, but you're, you're struggling. You're still trying to be patient. Tasabbur, you, you know the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever strives to be patient, Allah will bless him with patience. So even if you're not able to be patient, struggle, Allah will see that, and Allah will bless you with patience, inshallah. But a higher level is when it is actually internally there's peace, no matter what circumstance you're in. And that's the highest level. That's the level of rida. You know, um, there's the story of Ibn, um, Abu Hanifa, uh, he, he, he was sitting and I, he was teaching, and he had property. And you know, um, when we talk about not being attached to this, this world, it doesn't mean that you don't own things. You know, it's like the saying that, that, um, the, that Ali radiallahu anh said, that zuhd, that not, you know, that detachment, not being attached to this life, does not mean that you do not own anything, but that nothing owns you. It does not mean that you do not own anything, but that nothing owns you. So you own your money, but your money doesn't own you. you see the difference? If your money is given or your money is taken, it doesn't, it doesn't destroy or build you. It's not, it's not something that can control you, but you control the money. So Abu Hanifa was teaching and he had property, he had wealth, and he had been told as he was teaching that his ships had, some of his ships had sunk. So he was teaching and he stopped, he paused, and then he said, Alhamdulillah. And then he continued to teach. And then a little while later, they came back to him and told him, actually, we made a mistake. It wasn't your ships. Your ships are fine. He stopped. He paused. He said, Alhamdulillah. And then he continued teaching. And later on, they came and asked him, what was that about? What, what, why did you do that? And he explained that the first time when they told me that my ships had sunk, I stopped and I examined my heart and I found that my heart was not moved. So I said, Alhamdulillah, that my heart was unmoved. And the second time when they told me that actually I didn't lose my ships, I stopped, I examined my heart, and I found that again my heart was unmoved. It didn't move. I said, Alhamdulillah. You see the lesson here, is that regardless of what circumstance he was in, it did not change the state of his heart, his heart was still in rida. His heart was still in a state of contentment, whether he lost his wealth or he gained his wealth. And that is the highest level. And this is the level that if we respond in this way and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this response easy for us. If we respond in this way, not only are the sins forgiven, but a person is elevated in stations with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's elevated. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who have sab, who have rida, and who have you know, the ability to respond to hardship in a way that will purify us, elevate us, and bring us near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Aquli qawli hadha. واستغفر الله لي ولكم إنه غفور رحيم سبحانك الله وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك